Good morning and welcome to St. Andrew's Wesley United Church. We are an open-hearted, open-minded, LGBTQ affirming church that walks in the path of Jesus Christ because we long for greater peace, love, and justice in the world. So whoever you are, whoever you love, whatever doubts or questions you bring, whatever you think you have done or not done, know you are welcome here. This is a safe place to explore your faith. Today in our service, we are of a special guest, Indigenous Ministries Minister Reverend John Snow Jr., who is part of the Pacific Mountain region of the BC United Church. And he is going to be our guest preacher today, and we're really looking forward to having him here with us. In his role at the Pacific Mountain region, he helps support the region. He offers support and guidance to Indigenous communities, to the Indigenous Church in BC as well, and helps us work on reconciliation. So we welcome Reverend John Snow Jr. this morning. As we gather, we acknowledge we live, pray, and work on the traditional and unceded territories of the Squamish, the Musqueam, and the Tsleil-Waututh, and we commit ourselves to the ongoing work of truth and reconciliation. As part of that work, we're encouraging folks in this difficult time to support financially the Indian Residential School Survivor Society, which provides counseling and support to intergenerational survivors of residential schools. And we pray in this heavy time, after the discoveries of the unmarked graves of the Tekamloops to Sowetmik and the Kawas First Nations recent discovery, we hold those communities in prayer, in grief. But we also call upon ourselves and all Canadians to commit ourselves to the work of reconciliation. May it be so. Now let's light the Christ candle together. There was that someone that said that amazing things that people couldn't help follow him. One day they asked who he was and they say, I am the light. The Indigenous Minister of the Pacific Mountain Region, Reverend John Snow, is our guest today, and we're very privileged to have him with us. One of the inspiring speeches that has followed him through his life comes from Chief Seattle. Perhaps you've heard of it. There are, a different, uh, there are different versions of this speech that are floating around the internet, and there's some question as to which is the most authentic. So I asked Reverend Snow, and he says, you know what really matters is not uh, necessarily how authentic, how historically accurate the speech is, but are we paying attention to what the speech communicates? Are we listening to the message of the speech? And are we adapting our life according to that spirit? And so with that uh, invitation in mind, as a call to worship, we offer this segment of a speech from Chief Seattle, who was respected amongst uh, both the indigenous community and the uh, uh, the white community uh, alike. <clears throat> Hear these words. The president in Washington sends word that he wishes to buy our land. But how can you buy or sell the sky, the land? The idea is strange to us. If we do not own the freshness of the air and the sparkle of the water, how can you buy them? Every part of the earth is sacred to my people. Every shining pine needle, every sandy shore, every mist in the dark woods, every meadow, every humming insect, all are holy in the memory and experience of my people. We know the sap which courses through the trees as we know the blood that courses through our veins. We are part of the earth, and it is part of us. The perfumed flowers are our sisters. The bear, the deer, the great eagle, these are our brothers. The rocky crests, the dew in the meadow, the body heat of the pony, and all of us belong to the same family. I am going to interrupt myself or interrupt the speech. I just wonder, 
if we had not lost the languages of the indigenous people, would we have more of a sense of that? If we had learned them, listened to them, understood them, would we get what Chief Seattle is saying here rather than having lost it? If we cut out words in the uh, junior in the Oxford Junior Dictionary, words that contain to nature and our relationship with them, how will that affect the way that we walk through the world? Back to the speech. The shining water that moves in the stream and rivers is not just water, but the blood of our ancestors. If we sell you our land, you must remember that it is sacred. Have we? Will you teach your children what we have taught our children, that the earth is our mother? That question makes me shudder, especially as we hear of the bodies of children being unearthed in one residential school after another. Will you teach our children what we have taught our children? Obviously, we haven't. He says, This we know. The earth does not belong to us. We belong to the earth. All things are connected like the blood that unites us all. We did not weave the web of life. We are merely a strand in it. Whatever we do to the web, we do to ourselves. Oh my goodness. Consider climate change. How would that attitude affect how we respond to the climate crisis? It's a rhetorical question, but I think the answer is pretty obvious. May we listen closely enough to our language that takes us to the depth of our relationship with each other and the world, that we can understand that we are all in this together, very literally we are all in this together. Sweep across a distant shore Make full the circle of God Each laughing child Every gentle eye A forest lit beneath a moon bright sky Make full the circle of God Each silent paw Every rounded stone The buzz that echoes from a heart circle of God. Each fire brim star, every outstretched hand, the wind that leaps and sails across the land, make full the circle of God. Each icy pick, every pattern shell, the joyous chorus that a dawn foretells, make full the circle of Cosmic hue, every creature's way, all form the beauty of this vast array. Make full the circle of God. Good morning. I have our wee church in the background to remind us that although we are apart, we remain connected. A couple of weeks ago, we celebrated Indigenous Day of Prayer and All Ages Worship. And there we, we wondered about what it meant to be a good neighbor. Someone shared a good neighbor is someone who is kind. Another shared someone who is helpful. Somebody else shared that a good neighbor is someone who helps change the light bulbs that are too high for them. Another one shared that a good neighbor is someone who brings us cookies or we take cookies to them. And another one shared a good neighbor is someone who delivers groceries when we can't get out. And someone else said a good neighbor is some we, someone we play with and so many more. I wonder for you, 
um, what makes a good neighbor? In the Bible, Jesus talks about how important it is to have and to be a good neighbor. One time when he was asked to share everything he knew about God, everything he believed God wanted us to be, Jesus talked about loving your neighbor as you would yourself. And when the same person asked, who is my neighbor? Jesus, as he often did, told a story or a, or a parable to help them and us understand that we are to love and care for everyone, all our neighbors, not just those who live next door or that we may know or that we might have something in common with, but every person is our neighbor. In the story, Jesus talked about how someone was badly hurt and how someone who might not be considered a neighbor to the person who was hurt did exactly what a loving neighbor would do. He stopped, he helped, and he cared for that person, expecting nothing in return. We remember that Indigenous people have lived on these lands for thousands and tens of thousands of years before European people came and, and became settlers and neighbors here. And Indigenous people know what it means and how to be a good neighbor. For many Indigenous people, the whole world, all of creation is their neighbor. The wisdom and beauty of Indigenous spirituality include all living and non-living things as their neighbor. The plants and the animals, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, the land, the water and the air are considered a part of who they are called to love and care. And this comes from their experience of living on the land for generations and generations. Their deep care, respect and love of the land and all living and non-living things is evident in their living and being and in their deep concern for how it is treated. Sadly, if we and those who came before us had always seen our Indigenous peoples as our neighbor, we would have learned how to be good neighbors to one another and to the earth. Will you pray with me? Loving God, you call us to see every person and all of creation as neighbor. Help us to open our eyes, our ears, and our hearts to you and a deeper understanding of who is our neighbor. Amen. As mentioned, we're very privileged to have the Reverend John Snow come and be with us in worship this morning. John serves as the Indigenous Minister for the Pacific Mountain Region of the United Church of Canada. He is a direct descendant of Treaty 7 signatories and a member of the Stony Tribe. He is a sun dancer and a pipe holder in the Nakoda tradition. John was educated in Canada, the United States, and London, England. He holds an MA in political science and public policy, law, and administration from the University of Calgary. John is a seasoned speaker, instructor, and negotiator for technical oil and gas. He, was, uh, he has worked with provincial and federal governments both to advise on policy guided by the uh, treaties and the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the United Nations Declaration on Indigenous People, the rights of Indigenous people. Uh, John expresses a strong commitment to education and to reconciliation with uh, deep lifelong connections to the church. 
Reverend Snow began his work with the Pacific Mountain region just last August in 2020. Challenging time to come into that position. And he has been incredibly busy, especially these last five or six weeks. And so we're particularly grateful that John can be with us now. If you'd like to know more about John and hear about his family uh, story, uh, his father has written a book, These Mountains Are Our Sacred Places, The Story of the Stony People. And um, it's, a, it's a wonderful read. Uh, so once again, we're grateful that Reverend Snow can be with us. And he has suggested that our scripture for today to guide our conversation is taken from Luke's Gospel, chapter 10. And it's a familiar story, the story of the Good Samaritan. And even though those of us who have been in church circles for years are uh, well acquainted with how the story unfolds, there should be a shock value every time we read it and every time we hear it. Because when Jesus first uttered the words from Luke's gospel, it was radical. At the time, there was nothing good about a Samaritan. There was nothing to be, um, uh, uh, to be revered about the Samaritan people. They were the outsiders. They were wrong-headed. And so for the Jewish community to whom Jesus primarily spoke, a Samaritan, as a hero of the story, pushed their buttons. And once again, Jesus is able to erase the lines that divide us. And so I invite you to open your ears and your heart as we hear the scripture reading this morning. Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, You have given the right answer. Do this, and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan while traveling came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with compassion. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. So part of the uh, teaching and part of the, the, the unpacking of that parable is, who is the Samaritan? And, and we might rightly ask our congregation, are we the Samaritan? Or are we the ones who walked by? And I would say part of the calls to the church reach out to us. And so how many of us know the calls to the church? How many of us know that the elders labored long and hard to put together the calls to the church. Do we know that? If we don't, why? Why don't we know that? So these are, in the vein of the Apostle Paul, this is inner wisdom that we have to work. We 
can't look to a quick answer and we can't look to um, somebody else to do the work, mm -hmm. which is sometimes what society is waiting for the next app to press a button or we're waiting for some type of convenience to be put forward so that we can get our groceries faster or get our, our money faster. Well, exactly, John. And, uh, um, you know, to be honest with you, I have read the calls of the church more than once. I would not be able to quote them off the top of my head right now. And I suspect many in our congregation would not, to be honest. So uh, what I'll do is include the calls to the church in our Friday newsletter that's going out. And, um, and folks will have a chance to, even if they didn't see it before uh, the service on Sunday, they'll have a chance to go back to the emailed newsletter and refresh uh, our collective memories. Because you're right, it is something that we absolutely need to be aware of. And it is something that's already been asked of us, yeah? Um, uh, we also know that it's taken hundreds of years to get into this mess. We're not going to fix it in, in a few months. It's going to take a long time, isn't it? This is uh, the teachings and the statements coming from Justice Murray Sinclair. Yeah. I think he's, he is quoted to saying, it's taken us seven generations to to weather all of the abuse it mo will, will most likely take us another seven generations to try and attempt some type of healing that, that we really need to do as a people as a church and as a society so the question returns knowing what you know now what are you called to do? What is the church called to do? Because we seem more than likely to sponsor refugees. We'll go to a lot of lengths to deal with that across the world. And around our backyard, we like the uh, story of the Samaritan. We don't look into the things that are happening close to home. So the, the crisis on water, water crisis on reserves, we should be looking at that and trying to assist in the development of clean water here in Canada. And we're not, there's a lot of boil water advisories they talk about each day and the, the country has dealt with this for decades, but nobody's yeah. done anything. Right. So the question remains, knowing this, what are you called to do? Mm -hmm. What is the church called to do? What is our congregation called to do? What is our uh, individual um, actions called to do? And this is how the uh, story of the Good Samaritan continues to speak to us into this particular moment. And John, in a previous conversation that you and I shared, uh, you communicated a, a beautiful story of um, the Highway of Tears and how cell phone service uh, uh, was included in, in that for the safety. C can, you, can you repeat that story for us? Sure. I just wanted to share with the Pacific Mountain that I have been working with my brother, Tony. Tony mm -hmm. Snow is the uh, Indigenous lead for Hillhurst United Church in nice. Calgary. And Tony had put together um, seven Lenten teachings earlier this year. So one of the Lenten teachings, we were talking to a number of individuals that came into the... the um, Zoom conference that we were holding. So I'll, I'll say close to 100, 100, 200 people showed up each time we had our seven Lenten teachings. So one of them, and they're not all United Church, mm -hmm. they were searching. So one of the young women that attended our session was from United, the um, uh, Mormon Church. And so she uh, 
had uh, discussed with her church and her community, what can we do to help the women, to help the people on the Highway of Tears? Can we not get cell phone service? And so this was in early January, February, she mentioned this. And I, I believe by March, April, um, be, <clears throat> before we ended the service, before we ended the um, seven Lenten teachings uh, that we ran, um, I had heard that cell phone service was just created on the Highway of Tears. So that's coming from uh, a Mormon Latter-day Saint uh, person mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. who attended our who attended our uh, seven Lenten teachings. Mm-hmm. So I think we're called ecumenically, we're called by the Spirit, and sometimes we can't do everything as United Church. And this was one of the teachings from Dad's book, These Mountains Are Sacred Places. And he talks about the ecumenical movement, where we worked with a number of denominations and churches to pull together and to look at developing strategies, developing resolutions, developing calls. So one of the calls that is um, reviewed in our sessions when we we do the seven Lenten teachings, but we also do the indigenous teachings we just completed with leadership. We had about another thousand participants there over the the four-day session. Uh, One of those teachings is that indigenous day comes from Morley, comes from the ecumenical conference. And the first time that the elders gathered, they said, we need a national day of prayer. So that national day of prayer was uh, chosen as June 21st. We're talking 1969, 1970. The first church to accept that and endorse that is the United Church of Canada. Mm. 1970, General Council entertained that motion and supported it. General Council, 7071. Mm-hmm. By 1996, the day had been accepted in Ottawa and proclaimed as National Indigenous Day. All of that comes from Morley, my reserve, back home. And it was first endorsed by United Church. How many people know that? And why don't people know that? So again, it resonates with the Samaritan story. We're not aware and we're not prepared. And so knowing this now, what are we prepared to do? How are we going to act? And how will we come to some semblance of reconciliation, but also how will we come to some semblance of action, like the Samaritan was moved to act to help the injured person? And as you say, it's not just the the individual acting or a congregation acting or a denomination acting. This is a time for all of us to use the, the, uh, the phrase, all of us to be paddling together and to joining our efforts in a collective vision, even if we disagree with uh, political stripes or theological particularities, that uh, there, this, there's something important here. There's an injured person in the ditch that is calling for attention. Will we walk by? Will we walk by? I think uh, part of the hope is that the history speaks to me. And so the fact that we had the Indigenous Day endorsed by the United Church, I think that's part of good news that is not being shared. The fact that the United Church has apologized for the residential schools in 1986 I think that is something that we should be lifting up and discussing more actively. I would argue that if it weren't for the United Church apology in 86 and then the subsequent apology in 98, 
the Harper government does not apologize in 2008. So I think we need to take stock in the fact that we as a church have endorsed Indigenous Day. We have apologized to the best extent that we could. Um, we still need to implement those apologies. We still need to implement how we're going to reconcile and how we're going to be in community. The fact that we've made those statements is heavy lifting that has already been done by the church. I have particular hope because of the acceptance of the TRC, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and the calls to action. That is a work plan for us as a United Church. But as I said, we have our own specific work plan which is the calls to the United Church from our Indigenous elders. So all of those things give me hope, as well as the leadership. Our past uh, moderator, Jordan Cantwell, was bold. And Jordan uh, accepted the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People in 2016. In 2016, she did that. And she didn't change anything, not like the governments are doing today. I think governments are saying, we'll accept it if you change this or if you change that or if you limit part of the declaration. She just accepted it the way it was, as is. That's what we have to do. And that's what we should be doing as governments, as churches. We should be advocating for these rights advocating for those who cannot speak, those who do not have a voice, a political voice. What gives me hope is that after all that um, regressive policies, we couldn't vote, we couldn't travel, uh, we had limited rights, we couldn't go to school, many things like that. Um, What's the first thing we do when we're able to move? We go to Morley, we gather, and we call for a day of prayer. Isn't that magnificent? I think if I was uh, had my druthers at that time, I probably would have tried to, to do a rebellion. Right. Understandably. People, people would have been outraged. However... The elders held the day and they said, we need a day of prayer. So to me, that's what gives me the hope. I think that if we put our minds together, uh, there are many things that we can achieve through the spirit that moves us. So the question remains, knowing what you know now, what are you called to do? And that's a recurring question. Thank you so much for being with us, John, and for your service to the church and most recently to the Pacific Mountain region of, of the church. We're very grateful for your leadership and for your wisdom and insight. And I hope that this will not be the last conversation that we enjoy. Blessings to you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Strong with a restless.
restless current, spirit water rushing on to distant shore. God is carving out a channel in a new direction, yearning for an end to hate and war, like a river strong. Spirit water with love so deep and wide God is working through our hearts to shape a new tomorrow God will always challenge and provide Like a mighty sea, like a river strong Like a gentle rain, like a healing stream Like a healing stream, we bring ourselves together in prayer. Uh, it, woven into the prayer is the sung refrain, Sinzanina, uh, which means, what have we done? What have we done? As we open ourselves to the mercy of God and allow the prayer to guide us in our intentional way of living out our faith in the world. Let's pray. God of struggle and of reconciliation, be with us as we remember what we have been part of, cruel and unjust systems, efforts to say sorry and to mean it. Once again, we are reminded that our history as people is like a braid. We are wrapped together. And there is tension in that and sometimes pain, but there is also strength. Remind us of the beauty and sacredness of braids, the beauty and sacredness of relationships. Remind us to never again sever these braids, but to honor them in everything we do. God of struggle and of reconciliation, be with us as we recognize what we must be a part of, loving and just relationships, saying sorry, and meaning it with our actions. of hundreds of children buried in unmarked graves. Why? Why unmarked? Why buried? What happened right before they were buried? How did their parents and siblings feel when they heard word that their child, brother, sister had died or just went missing? Hundreds of children in Kamloops, also now Brandon, Manitoba, and where else where else this is just the beginning we fear we know oh god what have we done Water taken away, language, culture taken away, religion, tradition, community, ways of knowing and being known taken away, names taken away. Oh God, what have we done? So 
So this morning we pray for awareness. We pray for understanding. We pray for the courage to trust your grace enough, O oh God, that we might find grace enough to listen to others. Listen more than we speak. Listen without rushing to defend ourselves. Listen to learn. Today we pray for anyone worn down by systemic racism or suffering the injustice of racial profiling. For survivors of residential schools and their families that continue to live with that legacy. For people living on reserves without decent housing, water schools, and infrastructure. For indigenous neighbors living in urban areas, facing the challenges of prejudice and discrimination. For those living with PTSD and those who struggle with substance use. For the indigenous women and girls who are among the thousands of murdered and missing, for them and their families, as we lament the shame of what has happened, we pledge to advocate for their safety. For the waters, marshlands, lakes, rivers, streams, the great seas and oceans, for the land and air, may the whole system be protected for the benefit of seven generations. All this, as well as the unspoken prayers of our hearts, O oh God, we lift up to you. As we offer our lament, grow our hearts full of compassion for self and other. As we allow worship to be a uh, as to work in us so that we may be a better friend and neighbor to all our relations. Joined by the Spirit that moved through a peasant from Nazareth, we offer the prayer of our tradition. Our Mother, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As we gather around the table for the sacrament of communion, we are reminded about how we are meant to be, gathered as friends at the house of the Creator, sitting at the great feasting table. And we remember the Holy One who walked with our ancestors, who walks with us now, and who will walk with our children and our children's children for years to come. In the very air that we breathe, in the sound of the wind, in the sound of the waves on the shore, we give thanks for the fullness of your presence reaching us everywhere. In the sound of the children's laughter and in the songs of our elders, we give thanks for your presence arriving in memory, in now, and in the future. And while the world finds ways to break our tender heart, we gather those hearts and we lift them here to God. And here we give thanks. We remember the source and meet each other as brother, sister, siblings, all in Christ. Let us join together and pray. 
creator and giver of all life, source of love, we thank you for all your gifts. You brought creation to birth and sent prophets to awaken us to your great dream, a dream in which everyone is treated with dignity and love, justice and mercy, honor and hospitality. We praise you for our brother Jesus, love in human form, who showed us tenderness and compassion and cradle and cross your great heart of love. And so with the flying ones, the swimming ones, the four-legged ones, and the crawling ones, with rocks and trees, mountains and plains, with all of creation, we give you thanks and praise. Amen. So we remember Jesus on the night before his death, how he gathered his friends around the table and took a moment to be with them. And he took the humble bread, lifted it up and blessed it and broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Eat and remember me. And in a similar fashion, Jesus took the cup. And after giving thanks, he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. Whenever you drink, do so in remembrance of me. And so we pray. Holy One, our life is woven together like a braid, and the two become one. Bless this bread and cup that we allow your spirit of mercy and grace to filter and fiber our blood and renew body and soul with love, for love, in the name of love. Amen. The bread of Christ, bread for your journey. and the cup of blessing poured out for you. We have feasted, let us pray, for this bread, for this cup, so generously given, a promise of abundant life, held here at this feasting table. Help us be reminded that all life is sacred, that we are braided together as kin. Help us to protect each other, to love each other, to heal each other, as you offer us that same promise, that covenant of a rainbow, eternal and always. So nourish us, O Holy One. With this bread, give us life. With this cup, give us blessing and send us out into the world to do your work as kin together. Amen. Amen. Longs to color outside. 
inside the lines and tear back the curtains on coming in shine I want to walk beyond the boundaries where I've never been before throw open doors to worlds outside the lines we'll never walk on water if we're not prepared to drown body and soul I need a soaking from time to time and we'll never move the gravestones if we're not prepared to die and realize that there are worlds outside the lines my soul longs to color outside the lines I tear back the curtains uncommitted and shine I want to walk beyond the boundaries where I've never been before. Throw open doors to worlds outside the lines. Sometimes love asks us to color outside the lines, take a risk. Uh, who act against the comfortable status quo that leaves countless behind. And so Reverend John Snow asks us, will we walk by? And so many bodies are unearthed from the ground, from unmarked graves. Will we walk by? Uh, documents are being protected from the public. Will we walk by? A community is grieving again. Will we walk by? Or will we bear witness to what is happening and find some way to respond, listen and learn and find a constructive way to respond? Will we? The spirit of truth is unearthed with the bodies of the children and we are invited to come alongside as siblings, lives braided together, not just metaphorically, but literally. Because the world is sacred and calls out to us, friend, do not walk by asleep to the grace and blessing and wonder all around you. Look, see the beauty of it braided together. Receive the blessing of it. Be part of the wonder of it. Share the grace of it. In the name of the wild and untamed spirit of love, creator and Christ and Holy Spirit one. Amen. And Aiden will now take us out with the, with the fabulous postlude, Hymn to Freedom by Oscar Peterson. <laughs> 